Um, our guest speaker today is uh, Dr. Steve Felden. He's going to be giving a talk this afternoon about the idiopathic intracranial hypertension treatment trial and give us an update on the treatment of that disease, which of course is one of the most common diseases we see in, um, in our neuro clinic. Uh, but before that, uh, we had a live patient upstairs with thyroid eye disease that's going to be presented by our fellow, Dr. Anastasia Neufeld. And then we have an animus in absentia patient uh, with neurofibromatosis type 2 who's really had a rough time. Uh, Tara, are you going to be presenting that patient? Okay, awesome. So let's start off by having uh, uh, Anastasia present uh, the thyroid eye patient that was upstairs. Then Dr. Felden will comment. And then I'll have Tara come up, present the NF2 patient, and Dr. Felden will comment, and then we'll uh, kick off the rest of the day. Thank you, Dr. Katz. <clears throat> For those of you who were last night at the Dr. Van Dyke's dinner, um, we got to see the, the vast expertise that Dr. Felden has on thyroid eye disease, so this is a really nice way to put that expertise into practical terms for you today. And I just wanted to thank uh, the, the live patient we had today who is uh, present in the room, and we just really appreciate you being able to, to come and spend this time with us and uh, share your story. So my job really is to kind of give you the context of the, the history so that the discussion is productive for all of us. So we have a 62-year-old woman who uh, originally presented in July of 2014 with some systemic symptoms of uh, thyroid eye disease, and specifically some shortness of breath and uh, a bit of tremor. And of course, thyroid workup was initiated, and uh, she was found to have a TSH that was significantly uh, low and an elevated T4. Um, she was then referred to endocrinology, uh, who then decided to proceed with radioactive iodine uh, therapy, and after the therapy, she was placed on Synthroid. Now we move on uh, and fast forward uh, a few, um, almost a year and a half, and um, we uh, then see the patient in ophthalmology, and uh, initially she presented with some intermittent diplopia and some eye injection. The eye was firm to retropulsion on examination. She did not have proptosis at that time, and uh, definitely no optic neuropathy. Um, at that time, uh, we treated the, the dry eye symptoms and the um, irritated eye symptoms with a humidifier, some head elevation and lubrication, and uh, she was prescribed Voltaren uh, uh, systemically and Ketorolac drops. Uh, endocrinology uh, saw her again in March of 2016 and noted that she had pretibial myxedema um, and they were wondering whether this was kind of erythema nodosum versus pretibial myxedema, but they treated uh, uh, our patient with prednisone um, and uh, tapered that off. Um, this is the visit uh, in April where uh, we started to be concerned about the thyroid eye disease and its manifestations. The visual acuity had dropped uh, from normal to 2070 on the right and 2025 on the left. And uh, as you can see, the pressures in uh, primary gaze and up gaze are very typical for those uh, that are uh, seen in thyroid eye disease patients with elevation in up gaze. And uh, we first, uh, initially, you know, for the first time, actually saw an RAPD on the, on the right. Um, there's just some um, data here to suggest that there are indeed features of thyroid eye disease, and concerningly, color vision on the right um, had dropped uh, significantly to zero to 10 Ishihara plates. Um, critical flicker fusion frequency was also asymmetric, uh, again, indicating the right optic neuropathy, and there was some mild pallor of the optic nerve on the right. This is uh, the motility uh, here, and you can see that there's an esotropia and a right hypertropia that's seen in primary gaze. And again, uh, very typically, uh, up gaze restriction in both eyes. So I think this is probably the most important part of the talk, and this is the visual fields representing the significant optic neuropathy that's developed. So the first field is from uh, February of 2016, just a kind of initial presentation to us, which is really reassuring, but um, 
as, as you can see, uh, the fields uh, begin to progress. And uh, in May of 2016, especially on the left, you see the visual acuity drop to 20 over 250. Um, and you, you're starting to notice that there is some uh, visual field deficit noted on the uh, left as well. Uh, this is an MRI uh, that exemplifies uh, the, the features. Those are both axial and coronal T1 post-gadolinium fat suppression sequences. And, and th these are meant to show you the, um, you can see my, to show you the significant enlargement of the uh, extraocular muscles with compression on the optic nerve, and the same is seen on the other side as well. So just to go back to the fields there, um, how did we uh, address this and how did we treat this? Uh, in April, after the, uh, the first note of the uh, right, ischemic optic, uh, right compressive optic neuropathy, we uh, treated uh, the patient with methyl prednisolone, one gram IV, uh, once a week for three weeks. And she required a, an orbital decompression, which involved the medial and the lateral walls, as well as some lid surgeries at that time. So the story goes on, and uh, we note that in, uh, later in May, we still have continued visual field progression. As you can see, both uh, right and left are involved. And uh, further on, again, uh, we see further, further progression of the compressive optic neuropathy bilaterally, and the middle field there is done in June of 2016. Um, so something clearly needed to be done at that point again. And on July 1st, the patient underwent, again, a repeat bilateral medial and apical orbital bony decompression, um, as well as partial ethmoidectomy at the time. In addition to that, uh, retrobulbar steroid injection was given in both orbits. Um, in July of 2016, um, in addition to the surgery, radiation um, was administered to the orbits. And the uh, examination uh, in August of 2016 showed actually improved visual acuity in both eyes. Um, the pressures were still within, normal, uh, within the normal range. There was an RAPD noted on the left. Uh, color vision had improved. Um, and critical flicker fusion frequency had improved as well. Uh, the cover testing did show isotropy of 35 in primary gaze, which is, again, increased from the previous measurements. Now, bilateral optic nerves had some temporal pallor. So that is uh, kind of a, a quick run through the history. Um, I have some suggestions for discussion, but I thought maybe we'd get Dr. Feldon to come up and uh, uh, discuss the case from his perspective, um, offer his suggestions, and uh, we, can, we can go to the discussion questions if, if needed. I'm delighted to be here, and it's nice to see uh, a lot of uh, old friends and meet some new ones. Uh, and I, I, I hope that some of you were present last night and talked a lot about uh, potential new therapies and some of the frustrations with our current therapies related to thyroid eye disease. One of the things that's most interesting is that the incidence of this severe disease is actually going down. And whether that's due to people no longer smoking uh, or whether it's uh, due to some other environmental factor or perhaps we're just better treating hyperthyroidism, we're detecting it earlier, and uh, I think that uh, that may also be a factor. Uh, <clears throat> the philosophy about thyroid eye disease uh, is, uh, are, are myriad, but the treatments uh, are pretty stereotyped. And I think that uh, in patients who are not otherwise at risk, uh, giving radioactive iodine to treat the thyroid condition, I think, is uh, perfectly uh, reasonable. And this tends to be uh, sort of a local phenomenon. So when I was in Los Angeles, uh, you know, 90% of my hyperthyroid patients were treated with radioactive iodine. Now that in Rochester, maybe 5% are treated with radioactive iodine. So there's a lot of variation, which means that nobody knows exactly what the, the best treatment is. 
But I think it's pretty well established that patients uh, that have radioactive iodine do have a slightly increased risk of uh, developing eye findings. Uh, I think that that's been established in, in class uh, one type studies, um, prospective studies, and also uh, that patients who have uh, thyroid disease that's mild tends to get worse uh, with uh, when they get their radioactive iodine. So there's been I think a pretty, uh, pretty much a consensus uh, that patients who have risk factors uh, should be on low-dose uh, corticosteroids for perhaps a week before and perhaps two or three weeks after the time they get radioactive iodine, 20, 30 milligrams of prednisone uh, per day, and certainly not enough to get all the long-term side effects and not high enough dose to have short-term side effects. And I, I think that that's a good practice, and I certainly recommend it. Uh, to my patients. So the question here is, well, were there any risk factors? And um, so our patient uh, today, you know, had a history, remote history of smoking, you know, like in, in the 70s, so it's really hard to say that that is a, uh, is a big risk factor. Uh, the biggest risk factor is probably age. And so when you see patients that are in their uh, 20s and 30s, which is the peak for hyperthyroidism, uh, I think that uh, that are non-smokers, I think you really have uh, no risk factors. But uh, once you start to get uh, into uh, the 50s, then I think that the risk of developing eye disease does go up and that there may be a, uh, a little stronger case, even if somebody has no eye findings at all uh, for prophylaxis with corticos, low dose corticosteroids during that time. So uh, that's um, one thing. Um, radiotherapy versus uh, for compressive optic neuropathy versus uh, uh, using decompression. Uh, so uh, last night I mentioned that uh, when I first started in practice uh, in, in the late 1970s, uh, we, used, we had a, a, an armamentarium that consisted of high-dose corticosteroids, orbital radiation, and orbital decompression. Today we have the same exact things. So we have made, uh, in terms of uh, progress, uh, a lot of new uh, potential treatments coming on the market, but none that have really displaced the, uh, the mainstays of therapy. Um, and there's a lot of controversy about uh, the role of radiation, uh, uh, orbital radiation, and there are, there's a, a very thoughtful group that basically any patient, as soon as they start to develop uh, any kinds of, uh, uh, of inflammation or periorbital inflammation, they're going to go and get radiated. Uh, and then there's another uh, group uh, that, you know, radiates a patient maybe once every three years when they have terrible optic neuropathy. So there's no consensus. Uh, the prospective clinical trials related to, um, to orbital radiation for thyroid eye disease, uh, the, the one study that came out of the Mayo Clinic uh, showed no effect. Uh, but on the other hand, they were sort of taking all comers and it was unclear what degree of inflammation and where they were. And that's the problem we have with all of our patients in terms of trying to do studies. Uh, no two thyroid patients are the same. And so their endpoints are all different, and where they are on their disease is different. And when what, what we call severe thyroid eye disease, uh, uh, like our patient today has, um, is not, uh, we say, well, that's active disease. Well, it's not active, it's progressing in terms of symptoms and signs. But the activity is probably long past. There's probably not acute inflammatory responses going on. What we're seeing is scarring and uh, the effects of uh, increased uh, uh, tissue within the eye socket, the pressure effects that I talked about a little bit last night, as well as uh, the fact that uh, the, the orbital fibroblasts, which are, uh, are activated, are, are integral to the disease and either turn into fat tissue or into scar tissue, uh, and then uh, elaborate hyaluronin, which brings in a lot of fluid, which raises the, uh, the tissue pressure and produces some ischemia. So, 
as far as radiation, the only real contraindications that I see to using orbital radiation is if a patient's diabetic or has other severe vascular disease. Those patients do very poorly with radiation, and uh, I, I wouldn't recommend it. But in the absence of that, I think that this is a perfectly reasonable thing to do. The question is, well, should you use the radiation and steroids first, or should you have done them after decompression? I would have done it the way that you've done it here, uh, decompression. Uh, decompression works to alleviate optic neuropathy somewhere around 90 percent of the time, especially in terms of color vision and visual acuity, uh, a little bit less so in related to the visual field, about 70 percent. So that's better than what you get with radiation and steroids, which have to be given together. And also, if patients are already toxic from steroids, you're prolonging their steroids by giving them uh, radiation as opposed to doing decompression, where oftentimes you can take them off their steroids. Um, so in terms of uh, what for, uh, the new options are, I did publish one patient who, after, uh, who had a course very similar to our patient today, uh, who progressed and progressed and progressed, two decompressions, uh, and finally uh, I put her on Celebrex, which I talked about a little bit yesterday, because it, uh, show, it's been shown to really inhibit uh, the, uh, the uh, reactive response, uh, the inflammatory and immune response uh, in thyroid eye disease, and actually that patient did better on Celebrex and recovered vision, whereas on steroids was losing vision. So uh, there's one other thing. I, we don't have post-operative uh, CTs or MRIs here, so it's hard to know what the first and second orbital decompressions uh, do. But, uh, and I use a different technique, so where the, which bony walls are decompressed may be slightly different. But in the patients where I found that they initially got better after decompression and then got worse again, what I actually found is that the posterior wall, the maxillary sinus, uh, was kinking the nerve as it was coming into the orbit. And so you have the anterior, uh, the inferior rectus, say, will look like it's a hammock. It falls down. But it's being held up by the posterior wall. And so it's, it's kinked at that point. And when I've gone in and taken out the posterior wall of the maxillary sinus, and just, then uh, the optic neuropathy got better. And so I think that it's very important uh, for our patient uh, today to really go back and study those scans and make sure that you haven't produced a secondary cause for the optic neuropathy as opposed to just having not enough overall decompression. It can be very focal and, uh, you know, 10 minutes worth of chipping away a little bit of bone. Uh, and I tend to use a transantral route, which gives me access to everything but the roof. And that would be the other option for this patient. Patients who I've had who have failed on three-wall decompression, uh, Dr. Nafziger, a neurosurgeon, popularized the Nafziger procedure, and it is a transcranial orbital decompression. And in those patients uh, that I've had that have been recalcitrant like this with this kind of optic neuropathy, uh, they have done well uh, with transcranial orbital decompression. And that's the experience of the Mayo Clinic group as well. So uh, I think that you don't want to uh, wait too long if you're going to consider this route, but uh, the, the, getting the entire uh, orbital roof uh, removed all the way back and unroofing a portion all the way back to the canal uh, is something that uh, might be considered in this particular patient. Well, obviously, I can go on and on and on, but I think that um, it, this is uh, uh, a very concerning and not that infrequent issue that we deal with. Um, our patient is still on 30 milligrams of prednisone per day, and she is, you know, uh, that's uh, now you're producing a secondary disease. It'd be nice to find some sort of acute intervention where you could get off the steroids or at least back onto the non steroidal anti inflammatories. Any questions? That, yes. In terms of the order of doing the decompression or the radiation, some of our orbital people have said that the tissue in the orbit is just different after radiation treatment. Yeah. And when you're going to be doing a decompression, it just doesn't behave the same way. Has yeah. that been your experience? Well, uh, I bel so I think that's sort of true in some cases. Um, the, I think the problem is when you get really elevated tissue pressure, you get fat necrosis. 
And that's what you're really seeing is you're seeing the effects of chronic high tissue pressure and you're getting fat necrosis and then the, it doesn't, you get this sort of gritty, fatty, fibrous tissue stuff. Whether it's the radiation that enhances that or not, I, I really don't know. Uh, but, uh, you know, I prefer surgery before radiation. There are many people who do just the opposite. The real question is how many people didn't need to come to surgery uh, if they had had oral radiation? And the answer is actually none. And the reason is that all those patients end up with oral decompression anyway. They, the difference is instead of having it acutely and under you know, all sorts of stress, it's done electively in order to start the restoration process. Any other questions? Yes. I just wanted to add that the benefit that you get from radiation really is not immediate. As a matter of fact, you can really kind of stir things up a bit. So you have to be prepared for there to be more inflammation with the acute radiation, and then hope that over the next six months, the things really quiet down from the radiation. So if you're in an acute vision loss type setting, I think that what Steve said is very apt that, that there, there's, there's gonna be a decompression happening. Yeah, and so I, absolutely. The other thing is that the experience that the Europeans have had uh, with uh, IV pulse therapy, weekly therapy, is very much different from what we have here in the United States, where we don't, we don't they were talking about complete uh, resolution, reversal of changes, all this stuff. We just don't see it. And uh, in the high dose that they were using, the eight grams, uh, there, there was uh, a, an unacceptable incidence of death uh, from high dose methylprednisolone. I mean, it's not a lethal disease, but there was a lethal treatment uh, that was advocated. Now with the lower doses, and I, the recommendation is about six grams. But if the patient's getting worse while you're watching them, that's not it. Personally, I prefer oral steroids. If they're not going to get better within two weeks on 100 milligrams of prednisone, and then I can manage them and taper them, they're off to the operating room, and then we'll uh, see what we get uh, after that. So th there, there's no one way to manage these. Uh, our patient here today has been managed beautifully. I think that there's still more that can be done.